Now we want to take a little bit more of a detailed molecular level view of how the properties of a, an entire container of gas emerge from perhaps the properties of a single gas molecule or a collection or a small number of gas molecules. So to do this, uh, we're going to start by reminding ourselves about some lessons we learned from quantum mechanics about energy quantization and how the energy of an individual molecule is distributed. So if we have the total energy of, say, for example, a given gas molecule, then that's going to be composed of a sum of four terms, the total electronic energy, just the energy of whatever wave function state we're in. Um, usually this is going to just be assumed to be the ground state. And then plus the energy of molecular vibrations, the vibrating of the internal atoms in the molecule back and forth. And that's, of course, assuming there are at least two atoms in the molecule. If not, the gas, if it's just an atom, this will be zero. Then the energy of rotation. Again, there have to be at least two atoms in order for the molecule to be able to rotate. If it's, if it's just a monatomic gas, there won't be any rotational energy. And then finally, a type of energy which all atoms and molecules will have, and that's the energy of translation, the energy of moving back and forth within the container. So in order to solve for these individual pieces here, and the way we would solve any system in general, uh, would be to get this answer from quantum mechanics. So we would solve the Schrodinger equation, which I have a whole playlist on in the quantum chemistry and spectroscopy section, where we're solving H psi equals E psi. And just to jog our memory about a few things there, we have psi, which is the wave function, which contains all information about the state of whatever particle we're talking about for this particle's wave function. All information for particle or all information for that state. And then this H here is the Hamiltonian operator. It's composed, it's the total energy operator, which is composed of two parts, kinetic and potential energy. So if you just have one particle, the kinetic energy operator is always the same, and the potential energy operator just depends on what your uh, specific system of interest is. You specify a given Hamiltonian, and you will get a given wave function as a result. That's our Hamiltonian, or total energy operator. And finally, the last piece here, E, is the total energy for the system at hand. So if we were interested in trying to figure out what all these pieces were from first principles, we would set up the appropriate Hamiltonian and solve for the wave function, which would give us the energy. But we're not really interested in that today. We just want to be aware that this exists, and that's a thing which you could do if you were so interested. But we're going to look further into the components of each of these uh, four parts of this total energy here for a given molecule. So first, we have the electronic energy. Like we said, we would just solve psi the wave for the wave function of solve for the wave function of the electrons in the molecule. And usually there's a large difference in energy between states, and this is uh, usually in the UV vis range where these transitions occur. They're rather large energy transitions. And for the most part, we're going to just assume that molecules are going to be in the ground state because there's a very large separation between these energy levels. And we're going to see why it is uh, in a little bit why this is the case, that if there's a large separation between energy levels, you assume that everything's pretty much in the ground state. Next we have vibrations. We have that the energy for vibration, which is quantized according to a certain quantum number, 
is Planck's constant times a given frequency times a quantum number n plus one half, where n is some integer starting at zero and going up. And typically for vibrations, you have three n plus six modes for a given n atom molecule. So if I have a molecule with say four atoms, then three n plus six is going to be, or sorry, three n minus six. For a given atom, three n minus six. So if I have four atoms, then three n is 12, three n minus six is six. So if I have four atoms in a molecule, then there's going to be six vibrational modes and each will have their own quantum number and uh, characteristic frequency. And these transitions generally fall in the infrared range and they're generally uh, generally fairly large compared to the energy you have available to you at room temperature. Uh, most of them are in the ground state at any given time, but you can occasionally have influences from uh, higher excited states, uh, states above this ground state there. Notice that these are all evenly spaced together. Then next, moving on to rotations have rotations, their energies are equal to the reduced Planck's constant, h bar squared, times a quantum number j times j plus one, over two times the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia is just dependent on the geometry of the molecule, dependent on the positions of the atoms and how much they weigh. There's more details on that in the section about uh, rotational wave functions and the rigid rotor. And again, this quantum number j starts at zero and goes up from there. So these energies are quadratically spaced so they get further and further away from each other as you go up and up the ladder of energy levels there. And now these are starting to get quite close to each other. For a molecule that's nonlinear, you would have three rotational modes. and there would be two if it was linear. So three of those modes. And generally you find these things in the microwave region of the spectrum. Generally at room temperature, a given molecule has, uh, has several different uh, rotational energy states which have significant occupation. Maybe it's as low as three or four, maybe it's as many as 10 or 20, who knows? Just depends on the molecule and the temperature. Then lastly, we're going to talk about translations, rounding it out here. And translational energy of a given molecule is going to be Planck's constant squared over 8 m l squared, where l is the length of a given container or the length of a box, if you have a particle in a box, and then times a quantum number n squared. And then here we have n is an integer which starts at 1, goes up from there. Notice again that these are quadratically spaced, so they get further and further up from each other as you go up in energy. And these are have a very small separation in energy levels uh, between them. And there's many, many states occupied at typical conditions. At a typical room temperature, there could be uh, thousands or even millions of translational energy levels which are occupied because these, these spacings are very, very, very close to each other. And for a given atom or molecule, you'll have three translational modes, one in the x direction, one in the y direction, and one in the z direction, typically. So these are the kind of components for the typical energies that we're going to see in molecules. We're going to see what determines which of these energy levels are occupied and in what frequencies. And then we're going to use this to kind of build up a little bit of a theory that will explain, well, if we have these specific energy levels in which these are the only energy levels we have available, 
what determines how, how they are occupied, and then once we have the probabilities for how each of these levels are occupied, then how do we use that to predict, um, to predict large uh, macroscopic properties like pressure or heat capacity or average energy? So that's where we're going to go next.